if all of you are ready, uh, put a heart in the in the window or a thumbs up or something from your reaction box and we'll get this show on the road. <clears throat> Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark LeBlanc, and thank you so much for carving out some time today to uh, invest uh, today uh, into your business um, with uh, my brother from another mother, Henry DeVries, uh, my business partner in Indie Books uh, International, and my co-author uh, of our book, Build Your Consulting Practice. And um, sometimes people wonder why we do uh, what we do, or maybe why we do things the way that we do them. Um, that seems to be more uh, of a curiosity question on people's minds. And please know that while we wanna take uh, approximately the next two hours and walk you through a number of practices, strategies, uh, uh, ideas, uh, secrets, uh, to building your consulting practice, they uh, are often the most fundamental and essential uh, practices, strategies, and tools, whether you're a coach, a speaker, a financial advisor uh, of any type. Um, our sliver of the world is financial services. Um, but while, while we want you to listen to um, what we have to share, and for some of you, it will be a refresher, uh, for some of you, it will, uh, we'll be taking it a little bit deeper. Uh, and for some of you, it'll be brand new. What I also want to encourage you to do is to um, watch, how, listen for how we are doing um, what we are doing. And we not only want to share good information and, of course, intellectual property and content, but we also want to model what we want you to consider. You know, in the last uh, now 13 months of COVID, and I'm hoping that we can very, very quickly get to a place where every speaker does not open with, you know, it's been a tough year. Um, it's about time to let go of that. But here's what happened for some people, some professionals in the last 13 months. They retreated like frightened turtles and they made up stories. They made up stories like now is the, not the time to sell. Now is not the time um, to charge anything. Now is the time to give everything away for free. And I made the mistake uh, periodically of questioning people online. Um, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> um, because they seem to be rooted in the fact that it's okay to struggle. It's okay to be challenged. And it has been my experience that when your back is against the wall, that's when you have the opportunity to be more creative and more innovative than ever before. And it's not just the pandemic. This is all new uh, for us in terms of a pandemic. It is not just uh, the economic downturn of 2008 or uh, the devastating impact of 9-11. Um, sometimes it's just when you uh, are stuck or stalled out or stagnant uh, in your business or your career that sometimes you just need a little bit of a lift. Um, in 2008, uh, I was out of the country um, on a short 500 mile walk across Spain. And uh, I came back that fall in the middle of October to a lot of discouragement, disheartenment, depression, um, angst, anxiety. And that was only in the National Speakers Association, um, a group of people that should be a little bit better uh, than that and should hold themselves to a little higher standard. Um, but we found that even though 
things can happen that are beyond our control that can essentially wipe out our calendar. The end is not near. And I want you to think about your business in terms of three train tracks. You have a booking track, you have a delivery track, and then you have a money track or your cash flow track. In fact, um, the most successful periods of my career have been in 2000, 2001, 2008, and 2020. Because even though there can be times when the delivery track of your business can evaporate or opportunities get canceled or delayed, um, that is not what defines you. What defines you in terms of your uh, business success is the booking track. And I want you to think about these three tracks as parallel tracks, not competing tracks. And so sometimes when our back is against the wall or we've lost some things and boy, it, it does not mean my heart goes out to those uh, of you that are uh, with us today or listening to the recording. Our hearts go out to you if you or your loved ones have been impacted in any way, shape, form, uh, or fashion because of COVID uh, and the aftermath uh, of that. So it's, it's not that um, we are not compassion, uh, compassionate. In fact, I think compassion should be our next best business practice. So even though um, things can happen that sometimes seem out of our control, here is what is in your control. In fact, maybe the most successful people only focus on what they have control over. In the fall of 2008, when I came back from my first uh, 500 mile walk across Spain, and um, I wrote an article titled, Don't You Dare Blame the Economy. And I was on a business interview, a radio talk show, uh, Los Angeles, morning drive time, and because of this article, and the interviewer was sort of taking me on, and he said, well, Mark, that's all fine and dandy um, for maybe for you, but, but what about all of the people that are uh, the small business owners and entrepreneurs that have been impacted. And I said, um, it's easy if you follow these three steps. Number one, you create something new, a new program, a new product, a new presentation, a new service, or you take something off your menu of programs, products, presentations, and services, much like a chef might take something that he or she is bored of on the menu that maybe did well at one point, but has grown a little bit dull or stagnant um, uh, from a dining perspective. And the chef will take it off the menu and maybe experiment with it. And he or she will dress it up with a new sauce or you know, new side dishes or you know, whatever it might be, and then they put it back on the menu. And so whether you create something new or you dress, you redress something up that is existing in your menu, it gives you a new sense of spirit. It gives you a new sense of energy, something that you can be excited about. And the only time you should go to the marketplace is when there's a little extra spring in your step, or now in the last 13 uh, months with Zoom and, and telephone uh, meetings and opportunities um, with a little extra spirit uh, in your voice. In the National Speakers Association, we have a saying, and I'm not quite frankly uh, recall uh, where this came from, but 
Um, as the saying goes, people are persuaded more by the depth of your conviction than by any logic that you may uh, present uh, or possess. And when we are in a valley or when uh, we don't feel right, um, it's hard to then look at number two and number three of this little three-step process. Number one, you create something new. Number two, you meet and make new contacts. What are the strategies that you are implementing or executing that will bring new prospects uh, into your world? And then number three, for many of you that have been in business for some time, it gives you an opportunity to go back to the well. And what I mean by going back to the well is you're now looking at new and better ways of serving your database or the people that are in your database world. Today, um, you know, I don't even know if there's 10 secrets uh, that we're gonna share with you, but I know that we're gonna share uh, nine best practices. We're gonna share several strategies, ideas, some secrets, some nuances that hopefully will help you if you are in a bit of a valley, um, will maybe, you know, sort of rekindle uh, a spark uh, for you in the marketplace and with respect to uh, business development. For those of you that have been doing well, um, let's double or triple down on the things that you can do to keep that uh, momentum ball uh, rolling. Henry and I are gonna pass the talking stick back and forth uh, a bit over the next two hours. We will take about a 10 minute break on or about the hour. And so I just wanna set the stage for um, what Henry and I are gonna share and either uh, uh, let you know first time, if this is your first time experiencing me, um, that there are four phases to the marketing and selling process. Four phases to the marketing and selling process, and there are six sectors of potential. The four phases of the marketing and selling process are number one, the attraction phase. Number two, the meaningful conversation phase. Number three, the decision phase. And number four, the agreement phase. The agreement phase. The attraction phase, the meaningful or selling conversation, the, the decision phase, and the agreement phase. And how you navigate those four phases as my uh, good friend and mentor, Jeff Toole, uh, will tell you, uh, an internationally renowned sales trainer, will determine whether you are perceived as a pest, a peddler, a professional, or a prime resource in your sliver of the world. Um, the six sectors of potential. It's just been in the last four months, I added sectors five and six. For the last uh, maybe four years or so, I've been talking about four sectors of potential. We've added five and six. Sector one is new business opportunities with brand new prospects. People you don't know or who have recently come in to your world. Sector two, new business opportunities with existing prospects. Maybe people you've known for a year or more. Maybe they've been getting your email newsletter for several years. Uh, maybe they've been a LinkedIn connection. There's some degree of knowingness or not. 
because sometimes, as one woman recently said to me that I was meeting for the very first time, she said, Mark, I don't want you to be scared, but I've sort of been stalking you for about three years. And, and I said, what do you mean? She said, well, we are friends on Facebook, and uh, I've just sort of been watching you and reading your posts, and um, I know about Sweet Anne, and I, I know about the two little puppies, you know, the terrorists, and, but, I, but I, like, I like your style. So she is a sector two with a high degree of knowingness to me. But from my vantage point, a very uh, low to zero degree of knowingness on her part. Sometimes people end up on our on our database, and we have no no idea who they are. Sometimes people are opening up your uh, your email news letter religiously, and you have no idea who they are, and you're not even. Uh, picking up the phone or reaching out to them, especially those that have been opening your newsletter every single one for the last four years, that's what Henry and I would refer to as a clue. That they are engaged in what you have to share. Um, pick up the phone, send an email, find out who they are and, and what is resonating with them and often you will discover an opportunity to be had. Sector three is new business opportunities with past clients. There for many of you is where your sliver of gold is. Sector four is new business opportunities with current clients. How many times has a current client made an investment with some other firm that you could have helped that organization or him or her with? And when you had the conversation, they said, oh my gosh, I, I didn't know you did that. Anybody who's been in business for 10 to 20 years or more has had that painful conversation where a current client said, oh my gosh, I didn't know you did that. We cannot assume that just because they write us a check that they will call us back when they need us, nor can we assume that just because they write us a check uh, once that they automatically know all of the different ways that we can be of good service. Part of what will begin to position you as a prime resource is not only the fact that you are marketing to people, but that you are educating and motivating them in different ways. So sector four, new business opportunities with current or active clients. Sector five is new business opportunities by way of an advocate or referral. Do you have a list of your referral sources or in my language, your advocates? And what specifically are you doing to stay top of mind with your advocates? And then sector six is something that um, you may or may not uh, be involved with or engaged with. I am not, um, but that doesn't mean that it's a, it's wrong or a bad approach. Sector six is new business opportunities by way of an affiliate uh, partner or strategic uh, partner or as a professional speaker, a speaker's bureau, but someone who, if they make a referral or a connection and a sale breaks out, a commission is due. And that may look different in different professional services, uh, uh, professional service models. But there you have the four sectors of potential, or excuse me, the four phases of the marketing and selling process and the six sectors of potential. And I want that to set the stage uh, for today. Um, from a marketing perspective, 
or business development perspective, we look at the attraction phase of the marketing and selling process. That's where we want you to become master marketeers. That is not where you are engaged in selling. And for many consultants or professionals of any stripe, one of the most common uh, limiting beliefs is, but Mark, I don't want to sound like a salesperson. Well, I don't want you to sound like a salesperson either. I don't want to sound like a salesperson either, but if you sound like a salesperson in the attraction phase, guess what? You sound like a salesperson. And the, the only time I ever begin the sales conversation is after a prospect has raised his or her hand and given me permission to then move into a meaningful conversation. And selling is just a communication process. But if you begin that process in the attraction phase, then you will sound like a salesperson. And in many cases, you will be uh, off-putting or in my language, uh, can run the risk of repelling your prospects before you even had a chance to connect with them in a positive and meaningful way. In the attraction phase, Henry and I and Kathy uh, McAfee co-authored a book several years ago called Defining You. And the three tools that are critically important, we tend to think of the critically important tools as a website and your collateral materials and your logo and um, they're all a part of your visual brand, of course. And we wanna make sure that we are doing things to improve those types of marketing tools. But maybe the most important marketing tools are not tangible. They're the intangible tools of what I call your defining statement, your defining paragraph, and your defining story. A golfer has a short game, a mid game, and a long game. Think of your statement as your short game, your paragraph as your mid game, and your story as your long game. Most of your prospects want to hear your story at some point earlier on in the conversation. And it begins to answer the question, how did you get from where you were to where you are today in a way that brings street cred to my buying decision? And with that, uh, I'm going to give you uh, somewhat of a condensed version of my defining story. And so I just want you to uh, sit back and listen, we are going to make available the electronic version of Defining You that will walk you through all of the rules, the tips, the tests, the nuances, examples of stories, paragraphs, and statements. Um, but my defining story begins with something like this. I have been on my own virtually my entire adult life. In fact, I had a job once for about six months. And I found out at a very early age that I was unemployable. In fact, at 21, I was inspired by the two words, you're fired. And I made a vow that I would do whatever it would take to make it on my own. And I have. And this year, as I uh, turned 60, 
I'm celebrating my 39th year of being in business for myself. Uh, the first 10 years, I owned a creative graphics printing uh, and mailing company. And for the last um, 29 years, I've been a full-time speaker, business coach, uh, author, um, and friend uh, to many in business uh, for themselves. In fact, I think the future looks amazing. The last 35 or 39 years have not been easy. I've had my share of the good, the bad, the ugly, and the great. However, I would not trade it for anything. I think the future is incredibly bright. In fact, I have dubbed the next 10 years the decade for independence. Independent professionals, independent reps, independent distributors, independent dealers. There has never been a better time to be in business for yourself, especially if you sell your time and your talent, your experience, um, your wisdom. In fact, the acronym I like to share is WISI, W period, I period, S period, S period, I. W-I-S-S-I, -S -S -I. your wisdom, insights, strategies, stories, and ideas. And your story matters. I believe the world needs to hear you. The world needs to read you. The world needs to uh, be consulted by you, be coached by you, be trained by you, be inspired by you in any way, shape, form or fashion that fits your business model. And my goal for over 20,000 one-on-one -on -one coaching hours has been to help and support people uh, create a model for their business that they are excited about. That is always the dream or the, prom the promise I have or share is is not just to help you grow your business, but to help you create a model for your business that you are uh, excited about. Otherwise, this business of being in business for yourself can be too hard. With that, take a deep breath and let it out. Henry and I are gonna walk you through nine best business practices. I'm gonna start with number nine. We'll go to number one. Does not mean that number nine is the least important. In fact, I think it is maybe the secret sauce that will take you wherever you wanna go and can make the difference between someone hiring you for a transaction or becoming a customer or a relationship for life. Best practice number nine is listen carefully, respond appropriately. Listen carefully, respond appropriately. I wanna uh, give you a little acronym and that acronym spells clues, C-L-U-E-S. Whenever I pick up the telephone, whenever I answer the telephone, uh, whenever I click on a Zoom link, uh, to meet with a, a team or uh, a individual or a prospect, I'm always reminded by the acronym CLUES. And it stands for CONNECT, LISTEN, UNDERSTAND, EXPLORE, AND SERVE. I always, my aim is to connect with whoever I'm in conversation with, to listen carefully, to understand, truly understand um, what he or she is uh, sharing with me. Um, and I'm also listening for maybe what's not uh, being said as well as what is being shared. And then most people are reaching out to me when there is a problem, a challenge, an issue, an obstacle of some sorts. Nobody calls me and says, hey, Mark, everything is going great. You know, any chance I can give you some money and hire you? I don't really need you, but I just want to give you some money. Um, I've yet to have that happen. And 
So for exploring, we're always looking at how do we explore creative ways of solving those problems or overcoming those obstacles. And we all have them. You will never arrive at a level of success and forever be well, nor will you ever be discovered and arrive in a place where at that point, forever you will be well and taken care of. Uh, we refer to it as the gift in the grind, the gift of doing your work over and over and better and with more impact and influence along the way. And the S stands for serve. Every day I am driven by a single question. And that question is, how can I meet the best of what my clients and my audiences need and want? So I hope that you will jot that acronym down and keep that uh, uh, within eyesight or uh, maybe just even on a post-it note by your laptop or your desktop computer. And let it be a visual reminder that every time you answer the phone or click on a Zoom link, that that truly uh, is your uh, aim because it has always served me well. And when I screw it up, I am at risk, uh, possibly of not even uh, possibly damaging a relationship or an interaction, but somehow maybe putting a dent in the trust, uh, maybe that has been developed. And if I take someone for granted, um, there's a pretty good chance I might lose that opportunity or that relationship. And uh, something that I realized many years ago and have been um, unfortunately guilty of it more times than I would be willing to share. If you take your clients for granted, you can kiss them goodbye. Because you can make a mistake with someone and that's repairable, but you take someone for granted and you can lose that relationship for life. I wanna turn over the talking stick to my business partner, Henry DeVries, the uh, president and CEO of Indie Books International. He's gonna walk us through best practices eight, uh, seven, uh, and six. And we have another uh, special guest presenter here um, that we're gonna introduce you to. But Henry, will you take it away? Thank you, Mark, for letting me take the three marketing best practices. I've interviewed thousands of independent consultants in the last 10 years. I, I write the business development column for Forbes.com. And they tell me the, the same thing, that the, their biggest challenge is that they lack enough impact and influence. They want more impact and influence. And they also want more money in their pocket. Um, they, they need to take care of themselves. Um, we called it sacred selfishness, or if you, if you wanna give other people soup, you gotta have enough soup in the pot. So we're calling it sacred soup. You have, a, you have to have enough sacred soup in your pot to share it with others. And here's the way you get it. So let me tell you a story. If you've heard the story before, I'll try to tell it better this time. I tell it for a reason because it illustrates the three things you need to do. The three things you need to do is one, navigate an internet game plan. And two, you have to leverage your database. And three, you have to execute a mix of new contact strategies. So the year was 2015, the place was Memphis, Tennessee. We're in an 800 square foot apartment that Penny Reed shares with her teenage daughter. And Penny is at the kitchen table looking at a stack of unpaid bills. And she has no idea how she's gonna pay all these bills. It's a far cry from the 4,000 square foot home they used to have that she shared with her ex-husband, who was also her employer, who gave her all her consulting work. So no house, no employer, no consulting work. Penny Reed's a special woman. If you haven't met her yet, I hope you do. She said, boy, if you're gonna dream, let's dream big. In two years, 
I'm going to make $200,000 as an author and speaker. And that's when she met Mark and me. And we asked her, you know, Penny, what do you know how to do better than anyone else? And she says, oh, I've got this. I know how to help a dentist grow their dental business. Because let me tell you, dentists are screwed up. They borrow all this money uh, to go to college, to go to dental school, then to start a practice. They think they own a business. A business owns them. They're the indentured servant until they get all this paid off. But I know how to give them cash flow and time to enjoy life. We said, bingo, That's a, we got a business model here. So she, you know, I'm the marketing with a book guy. So she knew that there'd be a book involved. So she says, uh, well, what's going to be the sexy, provocative title for my book? And I said, oh, I got that. She says, what is it? I said, are you ready? She goes, yeah. I said, it's growing your dental business. It's what they want. And it's what you know how to do. She goes, okay, so the plan is we write this book, we publish it, then I get some speaking engagements, and that leads to clients. And we said, oh, no. You start calling people. Uh, Mark likes to say it's like a one-a-day vitamin, one a day. Start calling at least one person a day. And he said, who am I going to call? We said, people who book speakers to talk to dentists or dentists who might hire a consultant. She said, I'm going to run out of people to call in a week. We said, no, you aren't. You're going to leverage a database and reach these people. And well, what about speaking engagements? You're going to navigate an internet game plan to put information out there. You're going to be on YouTube. Uh, you're going to do postings. You're going to pick your social media of choice, uh, be it Facebook or LinkedIn. So Penny started making the calls, and sure enough, she started getting booked as a speaker and consultant, and Dennis hired her as a consultant because they wanted to know how to grow their dental business. So then the book comes out, and Penny says, oh, I, I don't have to make those phone calls anymore? He said, oh, no, you still got to make the phone calls, and you got to send a book out a day, 20 a month. It costs you $200 a month. It'll be the best business development program you ever do. And what else? Call the people you sent the books to. <laughs> well, fast forward, Penny does this for two years and she's at her computer. She's looking at her QuickBooks uh, profit and loss statement. She prints out the income statement, <laughs> comes off the computer and it says gross profit, $200,000. $100,000 from speaking, $100,000 from consulting and training. That's how fast this can work. Uh, you know, two years to that. Penny gave me permission to tell that story with two caveats. Uh, one, she said, don't make my ex-husband the villain of the story. He's not. We just didn't want to be married anymore. And two, uh, tell him it went up to 280,000 when you keep applying it, you keep doing these things. So you, you navigate the internet, you Leverage a database. Mark talked about the six sectors. So who do we send the books out to? Well, how about past clients? How about current clients? How about referral sources? Uh, Mark talked about affiliate sources. I certainly have those people who, if they send us business, uh, we, we send them a, a thank you commission. Um, who is it in your world? Um, then it's people who know you but haven't worked with you yet, sector two. Sector one are strangers. Uh, the secret of all this is not making strangers on the internet fall in love with you. Let me tell you, that's not the plan. Uh, there's much better ways to do it, to leverage a book. Mark and I believe in our heart of hearts that the book is the number one marketing tool. Speaking about the book is the number one marketing strategy. And I wanted to talk about what we call the showcase strategy, and what we have found to be the game changer. Uh, people who've done this is just change the game for them. You can do it if you're an author. You can do it if you've declared you're writing a book, and what you're talking about is the book that's going to be published. So there's miracles to this strategy both ways, and it's called the Small Scale Seminar.
And to introduce you to that, I wanted to invite Devin DeVries, the Vice President of Production and Promotion at Indie Books International, to walk you through how you could use the small scale seminar strategy. Uh, Devin, the talking stick is yours. Thank you. So today I just wanted to share a couple quick stories of how this strategy has been a game changer, both for our business, Indie Books International, but also our clients and how they've used it to grow their businesses. So when we're talking about a small scale seminar, this is basically a chance for your prospects to get to know you in kind of a safe environment. So it's a small group, perfect for interaction, but it takes away the, the fear that they're walking into a sales pitch. So that's kind of a little bit of the psychology behind it. In 2014, around August, we were only a few months into our startup of Indie Books International. And Henry knew that as a new player in that world, we needed to form some strategic partnerships in the industry to better serve our clients and also help us grow our business. And he had done some research and found that the number one public relations company for promoting books and authors was a firm out of Tampa, Florida called News and Experts. And he was able to get a call with their CEO, Marsha, and have a nice kind of getting to know you chat. And it ended, as those often do, with Marsha saying, well, you know, this all sounds great. Uh, you know, the next time you're in Florida, why don't you come by the office and we can talk more about working together. So Henry hangs up the phone, comes out to me in my office and says, when's the next open date on our calendar? And I said, uh, about three weeks from now, the beginning of September. He said, great, we're going to Florida. Okay. And he calls Marsha back up to say, oh, it just so happens I'm going to be in Orlando the first weekend of September. Maybe we could get together. And they got an appointment. And then she asked, what's bringing you to Florida? And Henry said, I'm putting on my marketing with a book and speech summit. She said, well, that sounds very interesting. I'd like to come to that too. Like, okay. So here we are. It's three weeks that we have to fill a room so we don't look like posers in front of the CEO we're trying to impress. And what Marsha didn't know at the time was that Henry made up that reason for going because he wanted to meet with her. And the perfect reason for going was to put on our own event. But here's more of the kind of the challenge for us is we're a startup based out of Southern California. We know nobody in that region of the country at the time. Our constant contact database, zero people in Florida. So what were we going to do? And that's when I turned to LinkedIn and we developed a strategy to use LinkedIn as an outreach marketing tool. And that really was the game changer to this strategy for us. So Henry um, believes in you know, setting goals with incentives. So he said, if you can get 12 people to sign up for this event in three weeks time, I'll buy you a ticket to Disney World while we're down there. He knows I'm a total Disney nut. So to me, that was like challenge accepted. And I hit LinkedIn really hard with a very simple kind of two-step um, invitation process. I'll just give you the real high level right now. But if you want to see um, kind of details on how this works and sample messages, we have a white paper we'd be happy to send you. But basically, the strategy is a simple one sentence added to the connection uh, message on LinkedIn. Um, usually just some sort of connection point that you're reaching out. And then would you be open to an invitation I'm hosting for consultants in Orlando? It was all we put. And so it's a real soft knock approach. It's not pushy. If they accepted the invitation, we followed it up with one, a one paragraph invite to our no cost event, a link to our website if they wanted more info. And that was it. So 
not spammy, not pushy. And I just found as many people that fit our target as I could within those three weeks. And, and that's the other thing I really love about LinkedIn is the power of its search. So all that information that we all put in is searchable. So if you know who your target prospect is, you can find them on LinkedIn using those filters. So in the end, um, I was able to get 15 people to sign up for the event in three weeks. We met with Marsha, it was a great meeting. We still work with her to this very day. She's done amazing things for our authors, getting them on you know, national, uh, national radio, national TV. Um, and she's also been a really great referral source for us. Uh, but that's not even the best part of the story. We wrote business that covered the expense of that entire trip before we even left our offices in California as a direct result of those LinkedIn messages. Um, so we had a few people that received our invite. One said, you know, I can't make that date, but I've been looking for a ghostwriter. Um, can we schedule a call? And he hired Henry to help him with his book. And then the other one, and this is kind of an interesting side effect of the strategy, is when you send them a message, a lot of them are gonna say, oh, who is this person? And they're gonna go and read your LinkedIn profile. And he had seen that Henry was a Vistage speaker and said, I've been trying to get into the Vistage speaking world. Can you help me with that? And he bought two coaching sessions. So like I said, that was all before we even had the event. We know every event then produces leads and prospects. Um, they may not always be the person in the room. It may be somebody they refer down the line, but it's always going to result in something positive. And we've then used that strategy across the country over the last seven years to grow our business. And we are so, we feel like it's the most dramatic, fast way you can make a change in your business. But that's what we recommend to all of our clients. So I'll tell you a quick story about one of our authors, Michael Haig. Michael, a brilliant storytelling expert out of Hollywood, um, worked with you know scripts, reading scripts for years. Um, he's, he's the person that Will Smith calls when he wants some advice on his next project. But Michael was making a shift and he had come to us with his latest book, which was called Storytelling Made Easy which was geared towards how business professionals could use storytelling, you know, the same storytelling techniques that work for fiction in their presentations and their marketing. But this was a totally new audience for Michael and he wasn't sure how, how to reach them and get in front of them. Um, up to this point in his career, he had mostly been brought in to conferences or universities he very rarely had to put on his own events or market his own events. So he was a little worried and concerned. So we said, you know, this, this strategy will work for you and we will help you to do it. And so what we did is we set out to plan his first event in Portland, Oregon. Um, at that time we were also traveling. So what we had him do, he was gonna be there for a conference. He just added one day on to the end of his trip booked a hotel for a half day and we went to planning and we decided to focus on marketing professionals. And like I said at the beginning, when we talk about small scale for one, a single presenter, we recommend five to 10 people. If you have multiple presenters, you can go up a little bit more. Uh, but for Michael, he was, he was used to lecture halls. So he felt like that was a little too small. So he pushed back a little on that and he wanted to get at least two dozen in the room. So I said, okay, well, we'll have that be the stretch goal and we'll use the LinkedIn strategy. And we were able to get 19 people to sign up for his event, which was great. And one of the things that we always recommend you do when you have these events is have you know, some sort of follow-up form or follow-up step. Um, something, again, no cost, an easy yes for people. 
So for Michael, we had him offer um, a 30 minute strategy call about storytelling. They could practice the story, they could ask questions, whatever they wanted in that 30 minutes with him, um, he would get, and that was on a form. And at the end of the event, he had 18 of the 19 people had checked, yes, I want that follow-up call. Uh, it turns out the 19th person in the room was his sister-in-law. So we actually count that as a 100% success rate. And within a week of having the event, he had a call with one of those people and they hired him for his services and several others after that. And that's the power of it. Um, Michael was a little nervous because to him, he was afraid that if he gave, you know, three hours of his time for free, gave them a 30 minute follow-up for free, that they wouldn't want to hire him. That's all, that's all they would need and they would disappear. Um, so that was kind of what we were trying to reassure him will not be the case because just giving them that taste, a way to experience you will be enough for the people that are interested to say, this is the guy, I found the guy and I want to hire him. So that's the power of it. Um, figure out what, what is the topic that your, your prospect is interested in and craft a, a webinar around it right now. We've been having a lot of success doing it virtually over the last year. So I'd encourage you to explore this strategy because it really can be a game changer. And with that, I will turn it back over to Henry. Thank you, Devin. So let me give you another piece of the strategy. What was the real game changer for us? And we've done hundreds of these events and we credit, um, we credit the strategy to helping us uh, earn millions of dollars. So here it is. Offer a no cost, no selling zone strategy call. We call ours a uh, book chat. Uh, some people call theirs a virtual coffee talk. It's a chance for someone to have a conversation with you one-on-one -on -one and get clarity around their goals, what assets they have, what are the roadblocks and how have others have gotten from where they are to where they wanna go. So that's the strategy. If you wanna write four words down for your script, it's goals, assets, roadblocks, and others. So this is an offer. If you'd wanna to talk to Devin uh, to have a book chat about a, a book idea, or if you wanna to talk to Devin about this strategy and how to use LinkedIn or get her white paper and talk about it, uh, our brand is generosity. You can have that uh, phone call at no charge and they won't bring any you know, sales pressure or anything on the call because we think that's what you should do too and be generous in having conversations. All of you are offering things that cost more than $1,000. Who would wanna buy something for $1,000 or more without a conversation first? But maybe you're not ready to have a, a, a meaningful buying conversation. Uh, so maybe they're still in the attraction phase and they just wanna have this information gathering call. That's great. Um, those are good things. Good things come out of those calls. You either get more conversations or they know more about you and they can be a referral source. Our business has grown by the four magic words, I know a guy. seven minutes after the hour. And at seven minutes after the hour, I'm gonna bring uh, Mark LeBlanc on to bring us home with some of these build your consulting business uh, best practices. Um, so if you just want to uh, put the pause on your video, you know, no need to leave and, and come back on, just pause your video, pause your sound, and then we'll start at uh, seven after the hour precisely. Thanks everybody.
Kathy, are you still crushing it out there? Yes, I am. I'm having good a really good time. I was thinking you. of your of the of your story and um, and then the story of uh, starting indie books and how much fun I'm having right now. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Well, you you remember my my declaration? You can grow your business. You can. Yes. Put more money in your pocket as a business owner. You can get your fund meter on max and you can have the kind of balance you want between your yes. home and work life. So congratulations. Yes, much better balance and a lot less stress. Yeah, good. Yeah, and I really like Devin's idea of this using LinkedIn, um, maybe doing a virtual webinar on and trying to market in that way creating a lot of new marketing tools as well for my business. Great. Henry? Just to jump in on that, Kathy, and then get us officially started. Um, the leveraging your database, but then navigating the internet game plan. Zoom has allowed us to easily record these sessions and put a lot more on YouTube. And that's really up the game. So that's something we wanted to suggest. Mark and I do a podcast every week. Um, <laughs> it started because Mark said, hey, we should think about doing a podcast. And um, I had one organized in a week. And that's 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 our two personalities. <laughs> let's think about it. And I'm like, let's do it. Let's do it. Well, I've, I've had fun doing things like that. I was on a podcast with Kevin Henry. Um, oh. And then I did a, uh, it started out to be a Facebook Live with um, Christy Cap, who has DIY Dental Consulting, which the recording didn't exactly work. So then we recorded it on Zoom and, and posted it. So those are some fun things I'm doing with the new people I'm meeting, Mark. Great. Your strategies work. It's great. Love it. Before I turn it back to Mark, I just wanted to say, we have been through emotional times and there's something we all need and that's more clients. We need to build our business with more clients and something that will give you more impact and influence to Mark's point is your story. Your story matters. I think people have hidden assets that they're not capitalizing on in this mix of marketing strategies. They're not sharing their client stories. So we gave you some examples today. Uh, there's also a hidden asset that you have that no one else has. It's your defining story. We'll, we'll talk more about that today too, because your defining story is about you and it helps create the bridge that people need to know if you're the person they can like and trust to help them solve their problem. And these stories are your ways of showing that. That it's one thing to have great content. I know Mark talks about, I don't want to take your, I don't want to take words out of your mouth, Mark, because that's unsanitary. But people are so in love with their content. Uh, but it's the experience and experiencing you that's so important. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my uh, twin brother of another mother. Uh, Mark, take us home on these best practices. Thank you, Henry. <clears throat> and I look forward to having you tie a ribbon around our experience here today. Um, keep in mind, the magic happens when people experience you. The magic happens when people experience you. If you are not where you want to be in the evolution of your business, a pretty good chance you're not having enough conversations, whether they are attraction phase conversations or they are meaningful uh, or selling type conversations. But everything you do in the attraction phase should be designed to lead to having more one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations. Best practice nine, listen carefully, respond appropriately. Best practice eight, navigate your internet game plan. Tip, pick one primary social media channel and master it. 
drive it to the moon in the next 12 months. And LinkedIn is a great example for those of you that LinkedIn and how Nev uh, Devon has navigated LinkedIn um, as our primary social media channel. Facebook is my primary, and but whether it's uh, YouTube or Twitter or Instagram or LinkedIn uh, or Facebook, pick one primary and drive it to learn everything you can about the one uh, versus trying to navigate three, four, or five in tandem. Uh, best practice seven is leverage your database. With the, camp, the two-step campaign that Devin introduced you to, because we didn't know anybody in Florida, she was reaching out to sector one prospects with a zero degree of knowingness. But if your messaging is on, on tap and you are aiming your outreach at the profile of your right or perfect fit prospect, you are much more likely to hedge your bets in a positive uh, way and get a greater ROI, even on sector one prospects. Then best practice seven, or excuse me, six, is uh, execute a mix of new contact marketing strategies. We think that some of the best examples for consultants and coaches and independent professionals is the synergy between the showcase strategy and the attraction phase what I call coffee talk strategy, or Henry refers to as his book chat conversation strategy. That's a one-two punch that you cannot beat because the magic happens when people experience you. So if they experience you in a small to medium size scale seminar or workshop or training experience, how are you connecting the dots from the experience to, and here's a phrase that I have used, and I'm gonna model it today. If you like what you hear now, you would love blank. If you like this, you would love that. If you don't resonate with Henry or you don't resonate with me or you don't resonate with Devin, just take the, this, these ideas and go make something great happen. But if you somehow have a connection to any one of us three, well, set up a coffee talk in the next 30 days or set up a book chat in the next 30 days or you know, set up a chat um, and we pride ourselves, as Henry said, on uh, generosity as a part of our brand. We don't need to offer you anything. We don't need to throw in a slicer and a dicer and a vegematic if you buy today. You're smart people. <laughs> you know, when the time is right, you will find your way back to one of us and your prospects and presentation attendees will as well. And I call it the deliver and trust mechanism. It's your job to serve it up and not hold back and then trust that your right, your good, right, and perfect fit prospects or presentation attendees will raise their hand for a conversation. And our chats are non-selling zones. It's a very important piece uh, or ingredient of our philosophy and our approach. You know, one of the greatest compliments that finds its way back to me is when I'll have a virtual coffee with someone and he or she will go back maybe to the person who referred them to me and they'll say, you know, I just had, I had this great conversation with Mark. He didn't even try to sell me anything. It's like, 
who does that? Um, you know, most people are trying to put you in a headlock, you know, and squeeze, you know, until you buy something. Um, so the synergy between the showcase strategy and the, the what I call the coffee talk strategy and, and then the storm starter strategy, uh, planting seeds, either picking up the phone a couple times a day or sending a couple emails a day. And the script varies from sector to sector because it depends on what sector of potential Remember the six that I outlined earlier in our presentation and the degree of knowingness. So there's no one script that fits all, but it's fascinating to me because I will have people say to me, well, Mark, I used to work with this one company or I've, I've spoke several times for this association or I have a coaching client, you know, and I would, I would, um, I'd love to go back and speak again, or I'd love to go back and train, or I had a great relationship with this consulting, uh, with this consulting relationship several years ago. I, I mean, I would love to do more work uh, with that business or the practice. And my response is, well, have you, have, have you, have you shared that with them? And, and they'll look at me like, you mean I can tell them that? I, I would, <laughs> you know, tell them you miss them. You know, tell them that, uh, you know, you really enjoyed working with them three years ago and somehow you blinked, you know, and three years went by. And if there would ever be an opportunity uh, to do some more work um, and you'd be open to a conversation about that, let's talk. You mean I can really keep it that simple? Yes, you can keep it. That simple. Now we move into the best practices around focus. Best practice five is develop your will do list. Best practice four is maintain your daily focus. And best practice uh, three is create the profile of your ideal week. So, number five, develop your will do list. We refer to this as helping you create an extreme level of focus. You know, most uh, consultants and independent professionals operate with a to-do list. And the litmus test question is, how many of you have something on your to-do list today that was on your to-do list a year ago and you've not yet taken a step to tackle that one. When I'm in front of an audience, I'll say, you don't need to raise your hand, just blink at me. And everyone is blinking and nodding because we all can fall or, or into uh, either guilt or shame because there are there are items on our to-do list that are jumping up and slapping us in the face. It's like, when is it going to be time for you to focus on me a little bit? Well, if you're not ready to tackle something on your to-do list, you're either not committed to it, or you think someone else said you should do this, or it's not yet time. Um, focus is not everything. Extreme focus is. And so when we think about developing your will-do list, here's, a, here's maybe a new frame or way of approaching this practice. Um, update your master to-do list and put about 94% of it in the parking lot. If you're not ready to take action on it, just throw 90 plus percent of it in the parking lot. You can pull from it when the time is right. But then identify what's the one most important thing you will do and get done in the next three days. What is the one most important thing you will do and get done in the next 30 days? What's the one most important thing you will do and get done in the next 90 days? And what's the one 
most important thing that you will do and get done in the next 12 months. Shine a bright light on those four specific, I like to call them enders, a three-day ender, a 30-day ender, a 90-day ender, and a 12-month ender. They don't have to take 12 months, might take seven, but tackle those four essentials. And then as you complete them, pull from your parking lot or grab the next one. Best practice four, maintain your daily focus. Maintain your daily focus. In short, no one but no one woke up this morning and thought, hot diggity dog, I get to work on my annual goal today. No one. Um, so step one in terms of maintaining your daily focus is just divide your annual goal by 12. What is your monthly sales target? I call it your optimistic sales number, monthly. Make sure you have that in front of you. Create a visual of it. You're a gambler, for God's sake. Every day you bet your time, your energy, your money, and your creativity. Where are you going to hedge your bets? Where it will have a greater likelihood of helping you reach that target optimistic number. So job one is just to have the number. Step two, in the morning, ask the AM question. What am I doing today to book my optimistic number of X? And then just write down three or two or even one high value activity. Just a couple of high value activities. Nobody's, nobody is ever gonna be found innocent of being focused eight hours a day. But you can be focused for 30 minutes a day or you might be focused for up to 90 minutes a day. But carve out that sliver of every morning focus. What am I doing today to book or contract for my optimistic number of X? Write down a couple of high value activities and then, it, and then get to work. And then at the end of the day, your PM question is that uh, end of day moment of truth. What did I do today to book my optimistic number of X? And you just take a couple of minutes to review your day, however it went, good, bad, ugly, great. You know, so many of us have good intentions in the morning and it doesn't take long and all of a sudden we're off track and we put our head on our pillow at night and we think, where in the world did this day go? How did I let anyone and everything get in the way of what I, my intentions were this morning, for God's sake? Um, you may be unique in God's eyes. You're not in mine. Uh, we are all challenged <laughs> um, by so much of what we are sharing and, and talking about today. And do not for one moment think that Henry and I and Devin have mastered these nine best practices. We are products of the practices, but that's why we call them practices. So optimistic sales target, AM question, a couple of high value activities. You know what high value activities are. You know whether you're uh, investing a piece of your day into something that is more likely uh, to have a payoff than not, or um, a high value activity could be as simple as picking up the phone and making a call, sending an email. In fact, here's a combination that I think could be helpful for many of you. And we refer to it as planting three seeds a day. If you got in shape or you got in the habit of making one call a day, sending one email a day and mailing one book a day. Some days I make three calls, some days I mail three books, some days I send an email and mail a book and make a call, but just plant three seeds. If you, 
if you get into the habit of planting three seeds day in, day out, and, you know, sometimes people say, Mark, you know, does that mean every day, seven days a week? Well, start with five. Um, but I think that you'll find that planting three seeds every day, even Saturdays and Sundays, um, my sector four clients love to hear from me. My sector three clients love to hear from me on Saturdays and, and even Sundays. But Sunday, I might just, you know, uh, autograph three books and, you know, pop them in envelopes and put them in the mail. So calls, cards, text messages, uh, emails, um, just get in the habit of planting three seeds a day. I guarantee you something. In fact, kick me on. Try it. Try it for the next 30 days. Plant three seeds a day for the next 30 days, and you plan to report. We call that the PTR. Plan to report. You call me or you email me, and you let me know how those uh, 90 seeds, uh, what happened. Will you book your optimistic number? I don't know. Um, but I'll, I'll guarantee this. You will feel a sense of momentum that maybe you haven't felt in a while. And if you look at planting seeds across those six sectors, how can something great not happen? If all of a sudden you're planting seeds with an affiliate, three advocates, some current clients, some past clients that you miss uh, working with, uh, some of your favorites in your rear view mirror. You know, I've often said, um, and it can be a startling comment, if you miss one of your past clients, there's a pretty good chance they miss you. If you don't miss them, there's a pretty good chance they don't miss you either. <laughs> you, you don't need to hang on to them and keep them on your database. You know, you want to you want to arrive. Here's maybe the arrival. You want to arrive at a place in your career where you are working with right and perfect fit clients, that you're only aiming your efforts at identifying right and perfect fit clients. Your capacity grows with right and perfect fit clients. It decreases when you've got some good fit, bad fit, and wrong fit clients, and hopefully not the occasional horrible fit clients that you're trying to save, you know, and they're driving you crazy. And you're not only going the extra mile, but you're going the extra seven miles for. So uh, make a note, fit is everything. Best practice three is develop the profile of your ideal week. Here's where you get your life back. You know, for some reason, it seems that it has become fashionable to be tethered to your desktop, your laptop, your tablet, your smartphone, 24 seven, 365. That's just silly. If an ER doctor doesn't need, if he or she does not need to be tethered 24-7, 365 to the ER, and they're charged with saving lives, you and I are not that important. <laughs> you know, our charge is to do good work uh, in the world, um, but it's critical. In fact, it might be life-saving for some of you to create the profile of your ideal week so that you know when you are turned on in your business and you know when you are switched off or unplugged in your business. I used to think that uh, some of the other best practices were so challenging for my clients. 
Uh, but experience has shown that best practice three, although we all know it makes sense, it's one that we, so many of us are incredibly challenged by. But here's the tip. It takes a while. Give yourself some space and give yourself some grace. The fun part of best practice three is color coding your week for God's sake. It's looking in the crystal ball and saying, this is the way I wanna operate my business. That's the fun part. That's the sexy part of best practice three. It's like, oh, if, if, I, could, if I could live up to this profile of my ideal week, that would be great. That's the fun part. The hard part is living into the profile of your ideal week. That's gonna stretch you're thinking that's going to stretch and test your resolve because these are the boundaries that matter most between your home and work life, but it's worth it. I think it took me 18 months to live into the profile of my ideal week and truly honor it. And today it has become sacred. I also know that at time, we're human. At times it's gonna hedge or evolve or, you know, periodically we make adjustments to the profile of our ideal week with, as we grow and make new decisions and that's okay. But start, start from here. Now we move into two of my best practices on money. Number two uh, is best practice to know your numbers. Know your numbers. And I'm gonna keep this simple. Um, it has to do with QuickBooks or the equivalent thereof. Um, it also means that you have your uh, QuickBooks up to date every 30 days. It means that you uh, print out a copy of your profit and loss statement every 30 days and you spend up to uh, 30 minutes uh, reviewing your income statement or your profit and loss statement every 30 days. And the reason for this is that you will make better decisions about your business development investments, as well as your office admin expenses and you will make better decisions in real time. You'll make course corrections. Um, uh, tip here is never look at numbers year to date. That's the traditional way that an accountant or bookkeeper would have you look at your numbers. All, every 30 days, look at a 12 month rolling set of numbers that will give you the truth. We're pretty good at looking at that report the middle of January and reviewing it, but imagine if you looked at a 12 month rolling uh, uh, period every 30 days in the middle of the month. That will help you see your real progress or lack thereof and get you back to center if you find yourself going off on tangents disguised as opportunities. And then best practice um, one is track your numbers properly. If best practice two is looking in your rear view mirror at exactly what happened, best practice one is tracking your numbers from a present forward perspective. Tracking your numbers properly is about focus. It's about momentum. It's about recognition. And it's about peace. And we have developed, some of you I know already have it, um, but send me an email, mark at growingyourbusiness.com, or in fact, better yet, uh, send it to my assistant, uh, the angel known as Kylie. Um, send her an email, Kylie, K-Y-L-I-E, at growingyourbusiness.com. Henry, could you please put that in the chat 
uh, Kylie at growingyourbusiness.com and just say, you know, Kylie, I'm on this uh, seminar with, uh, with Henry and Mark and, you know, um, would you just send me a copy of your 2021 uh, numbers tracking tool? At first glance, it will appear daunting. We've taken, uh, we created this tool in August of 2009. Every year we add enhancements and updates to it. Take the next nine, the uh, next eight months and just play with this numbers tool. Test drive it. Uh, put your numbers in there, put your targets in there, define your owner's compensation. The pipeline feature alone is worth your time in the numbers uh, tracking tool because it will help you identify your prospects in the pipeline, but it also recognizes the strategy that got you the opportunity. And it also identifies the value of the proposal in the appropriate sector of potential. And if you get into the habit of using this pipeline over the course of the next six, nine, 12, 15 months, you are gonna find out with amazing accuracy what two or three specific marketing strategies are paying off in proposals. And you're gonna find your aim in terms of where are these, what sectors are these opportunities coming from? Example, if most of your opportunities are in sector one, you're doing a great job with best practice six, executing a mix of new contact strategies. If there's nothing in sector two, well, it may be time to shine a little pin light on your database and see where things are coming from. If you find that a number of your opportunities are coming from sector three, that will give you the clue that, hey, there may be more favorites in your past that you need to uh, be aware of. And if you're finding uh, opportunities in sector four, it will help you position yourself as that prime uh, resource. And it will guard against your client saying, hey, I didn't know you did that. If only I had known, I, I would have much preferred to give you that extra $10,000 or $50,000 that now it appears that because we didn't know you could have helped us with that, that now we um, are using someone else. So that pipeline feature by itself is worth every nickel of time that you invest into it. Um, but like I said, the numbers tracking tool can appear daunting at first, but just like eating an elephant, you eat it one bite of, at a time, just take one piece of this numbers tracking tool every 30 days, maybe. And by the end of the year, you'll be a master. And then reach out to us for version 2022, um, because every year we keep adding some enhancements and refinements. The last uh, now uh, almost 12 years have been the absolute best years of my professional business career. And I believe that numbers tool has been the anchor or the rudder of our ship. That has kept me on the straight and narrow. That has kept me in the game, um, looking at what I'm doing. At times, it's like holding up a mirror to what I'm not doing. Take a deep breath, let it out. Best practice nine, listen carefully, respond appropriately. Best practice eight, navigate your internet game plan. Best practice seven, leverage your database. Best practice six, 
execute a mix of new context strategies, best practice five, develop your will do list, best practice four, maintain your daily focus, best practice three, develop the profile of your ideal week, best practice two, know your numbers, and best practice one, track your numbers properly. The future looks great. And on those days, when you are challenged by what I call the belief trap or the value trap, does what I have to offer really have value? Or do I really have the confidence or belief that I can, that I can truly do the job? On those days when you are challenged, just know that um, however near or far, I believe in you and that I'm only a conversation away. Thank you so much for being with me today. I'm gonna to turn it over to Henry to take us home. Thank you, Mark. I got too engrossed in your story. <laughs> And I've heard it before, once or twice. Mark challenged me once during one of these sessions about the reaching out, planting the seeds. You gotta plant more seeds. So sector two is somebody who's heard of you. This, I had a list of people who'd been to my seminars a year before. And I called this one woman and I had my script ready because I was gonna introduce myself. And she answered the phone and I said, uh, hi. Uh, I'm Henry DeVries. I, I run a company called Indie Books International. And com columnist i know how most consultants talk about their business in the same drab way it seems their message is i am also in business like everyone else that's the message and they don't take advantage of their hidden asset and the hidden asset is their defining story why well scientists have revealed in neuroscience that they've made discoveries that prove decision-making is largely emotional, not logical. So I encourage you to do what Hollywood does. And Hollywood is the emotion picture capital of the world. They tell stories to evoke emotions. So you need to tell stories to evoke emotions. Uh, I'm gonna end it with my version of my defining story. We told you some client mess to success stories today. Yeah, those are quivers, I'm sorry, those are arrows that need to be in your quiver. You need to be able to tell people that you're not a wannabe or a poser, as Devin said, but that you've actually taken people from problem to solution. At one point, they're wanna, they're, they want to know who you are. It's not the first thing you mentioned in the seminar. It's, it's not the first chapter of the book. It's not how you lead your speech off. It needs to be there, though. And they want to know your defining story. So to give you an example, I'll give you mine. I'll never forget, it was 20 years ago, I'll just never forget when my business coach, Gary Hawk, said, let's go out to lunch. I want to hear about your exit strategy. I was running an advertising and PR agency in San Diego that I founded. I had been previously the president of a large national agency. I found out it was much better to own and run your own small agency than own and run someone else's large agency. I was enjoying it. We had great clients. And I was so excited to have lunch with Gary. We went to P.F. Chang's, a Chinese restaurant, and over some Kung Pao chicken. He said, tell me the exit strategy. And I said, well, I'm going to grow this business for 10 more years. It's going to be running like a top. It's going to be a million-dollar agency. 
and then I'm gonna find a strategic buyer. After I do that, I'm gonna do what I really want to do, which is help independent consultants attract high paying clients by marketing with a book. <laughs> Gary said, uh, oh, okay, oh, wow. Um, that's not what I expected to hear. Can I ask three follow-up questions? And I said, sure, go ahead. He said, well, question one, how would you do this? And I said, well, I'll write books. I'll put on seminars. I'll give speeches. I'll, I'll, um, I'll align with a college, uh, someplace with lots of water and trees. Uh, my wife could work there too. Uh, it's probably in Oregon. Gary said, okay, very specific. Uh, again, not what I expected. Um, let me ask the next question because you sound very passionate about this. I said, oh, I am. He said, well, then let me ask you, why are you waiting 10 years to follow your passion? <laughs> that was a gut check question. Um, I hate it when consultants like you ask people gut check questions. And I did what your clients do. I lied. Um, I didn't know it was a lie at the time. But what I told them was, well, Gary, it's because we've got these contracts and we've got these employees and we've got this lease and we've got this agreement. And, and Gary, we have a wolf at the door. Every day to get into the office, I have to get past the wolf at the door. I love this wolf, by the way. I got it at Ikea. It comes with uh, grandma already, uh, yeah, already inside. Here, let's get grandma out of there. Okay, the wolf at the door. Gary knew that I was really talking about my fear, my fear that would I be able to pull this off? We, we all get stopped by fear. Gary let me off the hook. He said, okay, yeah, wolf at the door, I get it. How would you get started in a small way? And I said, oh, a small way. Well, I'd put on a lunch and learn seminar at my office. I would serve consultants turkey sandwiches and give them everything I know on business development in 90 minutes. So that's what I did. I took the last $2,000 in the checking account. I bought invitations, postage, a mailing list, had money reserved for the turkey sandwiches and sent out the invites. The invites were in the mail the week of 9-11, 2001, when the terrorists had the jets hit the towers, my invitations were at the post office. And you know what happened to business back then. Um, five of the top 10 ad and PR firms in San Diego went bankrupt that year. Uh, we almost went bankrupt. But a funny thing happened. At the end of the month, my conference room was filled with consultants who wanted the turkey sandwich and to hear what I had to say about business development. Um, I poured my heart out. The extent of my intellectual property was one sheet of paper with 29 bullet points on it. And I made the mistake at the end of saying, are there any questions? But yes, yes, yes. Henry, how much would you charge to coach us to do this? Well, Gary Hawk never asked me that question. I had no business model. So I PFA, pulled from air and said $5,000. And the person said, can I pay in credit card or, or do I need to write a check? The next month, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. It didn't matter the price. It was based on their conviction and how much of the heavy lifting I was willing to do. Pretty soon the heavy lifting involved writing their book for them and help them get their book published. Along the way, I was offered a position at the University of California, San Diego. I was the assistant dean for continuing education. I held out for four days a week. So on the fifth day of the week, I could still run this business of ghostwriting and helping people with books. Seven years ago, that wasn't enough and Mark and I decided to form Indie Books International. And we've helped over 300 people, either as ghostwriters, editors, developmental editors, publicists, help them with their book to get more impact and influence and put more money in their pocket. We believe you can write a great book. We believe you can persuade with a story. We believe you can put more money in your pocket. We believe you can grow your business by marketing with a book and a speech. 
but this story isn't really about me, it's about you. So what is it that you want? How would you go about doing it? Well, Mark and I have offered lots of resources and books and um, contact us if you need more. Two, what are you waiting for? How will it be better a year from now if you, if you don't wait, if you wait for a year now to get around to it? And third, how would you get started in a small way? I suggest you reach out and either have a coffee, virtual coffee with Mark or a book chat with Devin or I and get you started on your way. You can have more impact and influence and we're here to help. Thanks for attending today. Um, we've got nine more minutes. We've officially ended, but Mark and Devin and I are gonna hang around informally for nine more minutes. And uh, if you have to run, we certainly understand. If you wanna chat with us, we'll chat. We'll stay here until we outnumber you. So thanks everybody for attending today.